Good morning. Good morning. We welcome you to St. John's for worship here in the sanctuary or online. Join at us as we seek to tell in meaningful ways the story of God's unfolding love for us. Make our fellowship hour a part of your Mother's Day celebration today. We have lots of delicious food and desserts from our community meal last Sunday to share. Maybe you'll also take time to share at your table a memory of someone who has been like a good mother to you. We will receive our second Sunday offering for the Whitehall Food Pantry. Please check the bulletin for a list of needed items and also for information about our summer gift card program. Orders for geraniums for Pentecost Sunday are due by tomorrow, May 15th. The cost for each plant is $10 and the sign up sheet is on the bulletin board in the hallway. You can purchase a plant to take home or let our gardeners, Otto Mertz and Karen Wolf, add it to one of the plantings around our church building. Either way, red geraniums are a good reminder through the summer and fall of the fiery spirit changing Holy Spirit. Please read the announcement sheet for other pertinent information. Grateful for the good news that God loves us like a good parent through every up and down of life. Grateful that God trusts us to share that good news with others. Let us stand and greet one another in the peace of Christ. Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, 
one God, by whose hand we are given new birth, by whose speaking we are given new life. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are welcomed, restored, and supported as citizens of the new creation. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life. You are the everlasting wellspring. In mercy and might, you have freed us from death and raised us with Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. In baptismal waters, our old life is washed away, and in them we are born anew. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams. Honor to you for waters that wash us clean, quench our thirst and nurture both crops and creatures. Praise to you for the life-giving water of baptism, the outpouring of the spirit of the new creation. Wash away our sin. Empower our witness to your resurrection. Strengthen our resolve in seeking justice for all. Satisfy the world's need through this living water, where drought dries the earth, bring refreshment, where despair prevails, grant hope, where chaos reigns, bring peace. We ask this through Christ, who with you and the Spirit reigns forever. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hold together all things in heaven and on earth. In your great mercy, receive the prayers of all your children and give to all the world the spirit of your truth and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please pay close attention to the first reading because Pastor Lynette will be using this in her sermon. Paul stood in front of the area Epochus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of our own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, 
an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Here ends the reading. We're gonna to read together Psalm six, and we'll do that by verse. I'll read the first verse, then you read the next, okay? Psalm 66. Bless our God, you peoples. Let the sound of praise be heard. Our God has kept us among the living and has not allowed our feet to slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us just as silver is tried. You brought us into the net you laid heavy burdens upon our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out into a place of refreshment. I will enter your house with burnt offerings and will pay you my vows. Those that I promised with my lips and spoke with my mouth when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt offerings of fat limbs with the smoke of rams. I will give you oxen and goats. Come and listen, all you who believe, and I will tell you what God has done for me. I called out to God with my mouth and praised the Lord with my tongue. If I had cherished evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But in truth, God has heard me and has attended to the sound of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not rejected my prayer, nor withheld unfailing love from me. The second reading is from 1 Peter. Who will harm you if you're eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to the disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. I am curious, when people ask you or when you find an opportunity to talk about our church, what do you tell them? Do you tell them that you come because you like Mike's music and the pleasure of singing hymns with other people? We do have beautiful music, a dedicated choir, and we sing really well together. Do you tell people that you come because we are a reconciling in Christ congregation, open to people of all sexual orientations and gender identities? True enough, we do seek to be welcoming. Do you tell people that our church is friendly, that you have friends and perhaps even family here, that people here care about you? That's true enough too. Someone recently told me she came out to check our church out because comments on the internet said we are friendly. I hope that we can live up to that good reputation. Do you tell people you come because you resonate with our mission statement, feeding people body, mind, and spirit? And you appreciate being able to serve together in places like the food pantry. We'll be there tomorrow. True enough, we do seek to serve together. I'm curious about something else. Let's go beyond what we say about ourselves as a congregation here on the corner of 3rd Street and Chestnut. Let's go just a little bit deeper. What would you say if someone asked you why you are a Christian? I mean, there are other people who enjoy music and singing, other people who are LGBTQ affirming, other people who are friendly and service oriented, but that doesn't mean they identify themselves as Christians. What then is it that we believe or do that sets us apart from other people, people who might not be Christian or religious at all, but who are good, honest, ethical, and compassionate people? It's a good question. And it's a question that Paul, the early Christian missionary to the Gentiles, finds himself having to answer when the writer of Acts places him in Athens. As is Paul's custom in the book of Acts, he goes first to the synagogue to talk to his Jewish brothers and sisters there. It's a good place to start. The Jews at least share with him a belief in God and God's long history with their people. They share with him respect for the law and the prophets. As a fellow Jew, Paul can find lots of common ground with them. But Paul doesn't stop with people who already know much of his language and assumptions. He also goes to the marketplace to talk to anyone else who will listen, people who do not share his Jewish background. 
Some of the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers in the streets see, hear, and end up talking with Paul. They become curious about what he's saying and bring him to the Areopagus. They bring him to a more formal and prestigious place where he can speak and present his ideas about some new God they have not heard about before. While Paul has lots of practice talking with fellow Jews, and while he has lots of practice talking with God-fearing Gentiles who are sympathetic to the Jewish faith, and while he has even talked many times before with just plain old Gentiles about Jesus, this opportunity is an unprecedented one up to this point in Acts. Paul has a chance to go big time with the philosophical and religious influencers of his day. The Areopagus for philosophers or religious teachers is like maybe Carnegie Hall for musicians. The Super Bowl for football players, Madison Square Garden for a singer, or Broadway for an actor. Paul has the opportunity on this very big stage to try to explain his Christian faith to people who are steeped in and committed to their own worldviews, their own way of making sense of the way they live their lives. So what does Paul say to these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers? Well, first, he tries to connect with them, to comment about something they already know and appreciate about themselves. I walked around your city, Paul says, and I see that you are a religious people. As I was looking at your statues of the gods and goddesses and at your places of worship, I found something that also resonated with me. I found an inscription carved in stone with these words, to an unknown God. Your own inscription tells me that you know there's more to God than you have been able to name and hold on to in your many different religious traditions and philosophies. I can tell you now who that unknown God is. Your unknown God is the God I know who created the heavens and the earth. And since God created everything, God can't be confined in statues or shrines. As the creator, God places in us a desire to know God, to search for God, to find God. By being in everything around us, God is not far away from any of us. You know, if I got to preach a second sermon on this text, that would be a good place to start. God is not far away from any of us. But I digress. To drive his point home and to connect even more with the philosophers listening to him, Paul uses phrases from Stoic philosophy. In God, he says, we live and move and have our being. We too are God's offspring. Now, up to this point, Paul has not said anything that would have been terribly shocking to the philosophers listening to him. But then he gets to the heart of the early Christian message. He tells them something that is really new to their ears. God has chosen Jesus to judge the world, and God has made Jesus' authority as judge clear by raising Jesus from death to life. There you have it, a distinctive Christian message. In shorthand, we say, the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. In longhand, we say God saw what Jesus did on earth. God saw Jesus releasing people from guilt and giving them life through forgiveness. Jesus, God saw Jesus releasing people from despair and giving them life through hope. God saw Jesus releasing people from hatred and giving them life through love. 
And when the world tried to say no to that life by killing Jesus, God said no to death and yes to life by vindicating Jesus and raising him up. Now, what do the high-powered philosophers make of Paul's claim? Some scoff. <laughs> Nobody comes back from the dead, they say. Death eventually wins out over life. Others are curious and want to hear more. That's good. Still others actually believe. That's really good. In the book of Acts, that's Paul's typical batting average. It makes sense that this passage, with its affirmation of the resurrection, should come up for us as a lectionary reading during the Easter season. But it also makes sense that we would pay attention to this passage because we find ourselves needing to do what Paul did when he spoke with philosophers and tried to make a way. He tried to connect with them. In many ways, we are like Paul and the early Christians in the first century as followers of Jesus. They needed to explain themselves to others, and so do we. We, too, live with a multitude of religions or no religions at all in our world. Additionally, like our early Christian ancestors, we can't assume that Christianity is understood or respected by people outside our own circle of believers. Frankly, I'm not surprised. The church as an institution, a human institution, over the last 20 years, hasn't always given itself very good press. We have embraced or gently tolerated racism, classism, sexism, and homophobia. The church as a human institution hasn't always given itself the best press. By working so hard to preserve itself and its power, the church has often forgotten to do God's work in the world and so has made itself irrelevant. In many ways, like Paul and his contemporaries, we are trying to find our way. We hope that whatever God has in mind for the future, we might still have a part in it. So today, I find Paul's approach in Athens to be thought-provoking, even helpful for us as we wonder. What should we tell people about our congregation? But more importantly, how do we talk to people about our faith in Christ? Just as Paul walked around Athens and observed traditions of the Athenians, it's helpful when we carefully observe the people and places where we live. What's going on in people's hearts and minds? What do they need? Security? Purpose? Love? What gods do they worship? Power? Control? Sports? Fame? What philosophies do they follow, like capitalism or socialism or humanism? Just as Paul tried to find a point of connection when he talked with the philosophers about their unknown God, and when he used stoic comments and quotes, it's good for us to find ways we too can connect with and agree with people, ways that truly fit for us, ways that we can embrace with integrity. Perhaps, we can connect over everyday things, like the food we like to cook, plays we like to see, the plants we put in our gardens, or the sports we like to watch. For instance, Sue, I bet you could talk to just about anybody about making your spectacular chocolates, right? Leona and Brenda, I bet you could talk to just about anybody about the local drama productions you've seen around the Lehigh Valley. 
Let's see, Chris and Bruce and Otto and Karen and me, I guess we could talk to anybody about our gardens. Lana and Betty, I bet you could talk to just about anybody about the iron pigs and the fillies. I bet all of us can find ways to talk about simple everyday things to connect with the people around us. But I hope we can go even deeper in our conversations to find common ground with others when we talk about lifting up those who are hungry and sick when we talk about embracing ethical standards or caring for the earth. But ultimately, what do we have to say to people about our belief as Christians? What do we say when we go deeper with people? For Paul in Athens and for many of the other preachers and teachers in Acts, their speeches and sermons most often conclude with this core belief an affirmation of the resurrection. As we said earlier, the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, alleluia. So let's go back to our starting place for this sermon. What do we say when people ask us about our church? We can certainly say that we enjoy music at St. John's, that we are friendly, welcoming and affirming people who feel called to serve. But there is so much more that we can say. As Paul suggests, we are people who look for signs of the resurrection. We are people who notice and rejoice when we see God at work defeating death and bringing life. We are people who point out God's power to raise up the kind of life Jesus brought into the world. We call others to rejoice in God's power with us when we see exclusion giving way to welcome, when we see selfishness giving way to compassion, and when we see hope taking the place of fear. When we tell people who we strive to be and what we believe, some may scoff at us, some may want to know more. Some may even believe. Whatever our batting average may be, like Paul, our job is to get beyond the safety of our own friendships, the safety of our own walls, the safety of our beloved traditions. Like Paul, our job is to share with the world the signs of re resurrection we see around us, that God vindicates and raises up Jesus, that God is still saying no to death and yes to life. With our call to share the good news in mind, let's stand and sing together our hymn of the day, O Zion, Haste.
let us join with the whole church as we confess our faith in God, the God in whom we live and move and have our being. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. Today, we will remember in our prayers the following people, Jean L., Wendy, Christopher, Helen, Paul, Dylan, Paula, Shirley, Lynn, Janice, Dale, Adrian, Charlene, Bill, Ben, Lori, John, Janet, Susan, Tom, Marv, Mary Jane, Steve, Joanne, Gloria, Matt, Andy, and Steve. And also for the family of Dr. Louise Gusset, Pastor Lynette's college English professor and academic mother. United in hope and the joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God, our faithful companion, you promised to never leave us and to send your spirit to guide us in wisdom and truth. Send your people into the world to serve as mirrors that reflect and magnify your love. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. All the earth sings praises to you. Grant your care to the creatures, plants, and places that are suffering, and equip us to respond to their song. Make us agents of restoration and refreshment for all your beloved creation. Hear us, O oh God. You call all people of the world your children. Judge the nations justly. Show mercy to all who are oppressed, and speak truth to power through your prophets. Hear us, O oh God. Nurturing Lord, you sent your spirit to grant us peace. Make your presence known to those who feel abandoned or alone, and to all who are sick or grieving. Hear us, O oh God. You hold us in your loving care. On this Mother's Day, receive our thanks for all who provide mother motherly care. May our appreciation of them be filled with warmth and joy. Console all who long to be mothers, children estranged from their mothers, anyone grieving the death of a mother, and console mothers who have lost a child. Support all for whom this day is difficult. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For mass shooting victims and their families in Allen, Texas and across the country. 
for increased openness to political deliberation regarding access to assault weapons or spirit of cooperation among congressional leaders as we approach the debt ceiling. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. For countries embroiled in long-term unrest and war, especially in Ukraine, Syria, Haiti, Mexico, Palestine, Israel, and Sudan. That peace talks between warring factions in Sudan will bear fruit for refugees and immigrants on the U.S. southern border and for all agencies, policies, and advocates that care for their well-being. Hear us, O oh God. Almighty God, you give life and breath to all things. We give thanks for the Apostle Matthias and for all your saints. Sustain us by your love until we join the saints in glory. Hear us, O oh God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. God has entrusted us with news that is too good not to share. Where there is guilt, God offers forgiveness. Where there is despair, God offers hope. Where there is emptiness, God offers love and purpose. Grateful for this good news and that God trusts us to share it with the world. Let us bring to God the gifts of our time and words, our energy and financial resources. Let us give them and see how God will use them and us to bring life and love to the world around us. Let's stand to sing our offering song. God, in this meal you offer your very self. We give thanks for these gifts of the earth. In the breaking of this bread, reveal to us the risen one, and in the pouring out of this wine, pour us out in service to the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. He left it. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. And praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember Christ's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. O God of resurrection and new life, Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth, burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, Come and know Christ, broken and poured out for you.
Let us pray. Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. With your word and this meal of grace, you have nourished our life together. Strengthen us to show your love and to serve the world in Jesus' name. Amen. The God of all who raised Jesus from the dead bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the new creation. Amen. Amen. Peace, serve the risen one. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.